Often in life we meet people who are strongly based on yes, especially concerning themselves. They have no conception of no when it comes to themselves. They can't see the opposite contradictory side in themselves. You'll see this in yourself to some degree, but the reason I choose someone else to think about is because it's easier to see when it's someone else. And we're not all as strongly based in this. We've been in this work long enough that we're not so strongly based in yes concerning ourselves. If you find somebody like that, you'll find that they always tell the truth. They always do right. They always are right. They always know exactly what they're doing. And quite frankly, the long and the short of it is there's really nothing wrong with them that matters. If you'll look back at your life pre this work, you'll see that you were very much more a person based on yes concerning yourself with no conception of no concerning you. There really wasn't a lot to change. You really had it wired pretty well. You were right. And this work has introduced such self-doubt into us that it becomes difficult to continue to support that kind of a yes-based construct of our own lives. These kinds of people, the kinds of people we were, or we were more like, they're really yes-men to themselves. They're dead in themselves and to themselves. They can't grow internally. They're dead in a work sense, so they can be alive, as in not in the morgue, not in a mortuary. But in the work sense, there's nothing there. They don't have much potential for growth because they're dead. And something has to be alive. There has to be some life in something for it to have any potential to grow. The work constantly tries to break this inner situation down because the person can never really become a real person based in this yes conception of ourselves. It's difficult because they remain invented. They remain an imaginary person. You have seen through some degree of self-observation that you are pretty much an invented person. You know, who is sitting there is not a real person. It's invented. A lot of it was invented by your parents. You are what your parents wanted you to be. A lot of our push, a lot of our thrust in life, a lot of our inertia came from what our parents wanted from us, what they required of us, the direction that they pushed us drove us. And so that direction over time gathered speed and we garnered more and more mass until it finally had an inertia in and of its own. And we didn't have to do anything to keep moving in that direction. And everything that we did do just perpetuated that direction. It just added to the velocity and added to the mass of that direction so that it became easier and easier to continue in that direction. And then at some point, something comes along, some big event comes along and hits us and maybe knocks us off course a little bit. And we could change direction at that point. If we become conscious at that point, we could change direction. Do you see a man wise in his own eyes, Proverbs says, there's more hope for a fool than for him. A person who's not quite so sure of himself, who doesn't accept all of his opinions and valuations without some doubt, doesn't take himself for granted, has a possibility of change. A person strongly based in yes concerning themselves has no possibility of change. What's there to change? Everybody else is wrong. What's there to change? They're right, and they can prove it a million different ways, a hundred thousand different ways in just this shade of purple. And then there's all the rest of the shades of red going to blue. We really have an airtight case when you think about it. When you think about how the invented self, this invented personality, is supported, it's really airtight. There's nothing that can tear it down in our system. And this is why we need something that comes from outside of our system. And this is where the work comes in. The work is constantly trying to erode that, constantly trying to undermine that. So naturally, to a person who is strongly based in yes concerning themselves, the work is going to be a major irritant, and it's not going to be easily accepted. You'll be able to find a lot of things wrong with it. You'll be able to speak against it a lot. You'll be able to tear it down a lot. You'll be able to find a lot of other people who agree with you. Actually, it doesn't take long to just get rid of it altogether. If a person who isn't quite so sure of himself begins to work, he'll gradually be shown at the right time by the action of the work where the no side comes in. As I said last week, we hop on one foot. Yes, 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 yes. No, 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 no. It's all heavy-footed hopping in our thought process. 
But if we can introduce some self-doubt, then we can gradually be shown by the action of the work where this no side comes in, where we're not what we imagined and said yes to. We all imagine we're generous, kind, loving, reasonable people. And it's very difficult to find examples where we're not. And when we do find examples where we're not generous, kind, loving, reasonable people, we can find so many justifications for why that's an exception. That's not really the way it is. That's an exception based on some incredible circumstance. That was sunspots or Mercury in retrograde or Pluto did something, you know, it went the wrong way on its axis. We have some bizarre thing that proves that we really are the imagined self and not this other self that's just this kind of this just this blip on the radar screen. Oh, that's not the way it really is. I mean, yes, that happened. It's a, a slight blemish. But it's nothing that really matters. And so you see how heavily based we are in this yes thing about ourselves. We're constantly saying yes to ourselves. And ourselves, unfortunately, is false personality. We begin to be free from the active power of the personality, which has dominated us when we can start to introduce this no side to our own imaginary self. It's a difficult thing. It's not easy, but it can be done. No growth to the essential side of us is possible until the personality becomes more passive. I know you've heard this a hundred thousand times, or a lot. You've heard it a lot. I say it a lot. No growth is possible to the essential part of us until the personality, the false part of us, the acquired part of us, the invented part of us, the imagined part of us, starts to become passive. It makes sense as long as it's getting all of the yes, all of the affirmation, all of the best food, all of the best energy, all of the best attention, all of the best light. It's going to continue to grow until it can be made a little more passive and some of the light and the energy that goes to it can go to the essential side of us. There's really no hope for us, which means in this world there's very little hope for us. This is not a popular thing to be talking about these days. Look at TV or look at seminars or what's going on in the world. People are lying through their teeth to everyone, and people like it. This is like sauces of cream to kittens. People will pay huge sums of money to have smoke blown in their face about who they are and what their possibilities are. And it's difficult to find someone who will tell you the truth. And the truth is, you have almost no chance of any kind of inner growth as you are. You have got to begin to say no to yourself instead of yes to yourself all the time. You've got to stop believing in all of the things that you've been believing in the majority of your life. And that's just too uncomfortable for most people to do. That's why we say this work is not for everyone. This work is for very few people, quite frankly. In the first stage of life, the personality's got to be built up strongly. But the second stage of life, the esoteric stage, our second esoteric education, personality must become more and more passive. It's necessary. It has to be built. Personality has to be built. It's the only way we can survive in this environment. It's like being dropped down on Mars without a space suit. You better get one in a hurry. You don't have much time. You've got to get some kind of atmosphere that you can breathe. And false personality is that. It's like our space suit while we're here in this environment. But there comes a time when we can become free from that. But unfortunately, we have been wearing it for so long, we don't know we're wearing it anymore. We think we are it. We've looked in the mirror, we've bathed with it on, we've lived in it for so long, we don't know that it's not us. And so the main shock is for us to realize, look, this is not you. And so we begin to observe ourselves, and we begin to say no to negative emotions. That is not I. We have this urge to do something. We want something. We want to say something. We want to get something. And we step back from it and say, no, that is not I. Yes, it is. Everything is inside of us is screaming, yes, it is. That's what I want. No, that's not I. When we get a little bit of separation, we can see that it really isn't I. It really isn't the best part of me. It really isn't the highest that I have ever been or that I have ever seen and observed inside of myself. It's really just another vicious, mechanical little thing that wants its way. These are difficult things to face about yourself. But when you start to face them, you begin to be able to say no to yourself. You begin to say, well, wait a second, that is not I. 
Therefore, I don't have to listen to it. I don't have to do what it says. I don't have to be its slave any longer. It's a test and it takes a struggle and we don't always win. But if we struggle, we've always gained something for ourselves. And the next time, perhaps it will be a little bit easier. This is our hope. The values that we've attached to the personality must undergo a change. We can no longer be like what we were. This is another horrible shock for us. You can't be who you have been your whole life. Well, what's wrong with who I've been my whole life? I've been pretty good. Well, pretty good's not good enough. If you want your life to go the way it's going, stay the same. Stay pretty good. But pretty good's not good enough if you want to raise the bar, if you want more, if you want to find what it is that you intuitively have been looking for. If you want to satisfy this noxious, irritating craving that you have had your entire life for something that you can't quite grasp, you're going to have to bite the bullet. And you're going to have to bite the hand that feeds you. And the hand that feeds you is your false personality, who you think you are. You're going to have to take a big bite out of that. You're going to have to undergo a change. Ospensky said, it would be very good for some of you to deliberately argue against what you hold to be right and true and good. Try to make the opposite standpoint deliberately at times and see what happens to you. The stronger you are, the more I recommend that you do this. The stronger opinions that you have, the more like me you are, the more you have strong opinions or strong points of view that you can convince logically, charismatically, or in whatever way, convince other people of, the more you need to take the opposite, deliberately take the opposite point of view and argue it. It was one of the things we had to do in school, in speech class, I remember, was we had to take whatever it was we believed, and we had to argue the opposite. And often we would argue the opposite with somebody who believed the opposite, but was arguing the opposite with us. And it was, um, it was interesting. I remember one of the things, I didn't smoke, and a girl that I was debating or arguing with, whatever it was called, she did smoke. She took that smoking is bad, and I had to take smoking is good. Yeah, anyway. It was an interesting experience. And as you can tell, I had to wake up a little bit because I can remember this vividly. Sometimes it can help you to doubt your own opinions, your own yes, and realize there are other points of view to which you can't say no. This is the number one most difficult task I have with you, each of you individually, is getting you to doubt yourself, getting you to doubt that the way you are seeing something is the way it is. It's kind of funny, actually how sure we are of ourselves. And introducing this no is a big deal. In the work, you have to reach a stage where you can be turned and twisted in every direction, yet always write yourself and point yourself in the direction of the work eventually. In other words, I should be able to tear this work apart. I should be able to absolutely just tear this work apart and argue against it. And instead of you being thrown by that, which many of you would be radically thrown and shaken, Instead of you being thrown, you should be able to write yourself and to point yourself back in the direction of the work, no matter what kind of onslaught I bring against it, or no matter what anybody brings against it. And if you can't do that, well then, you need to look to yourself and see what it is you've been doing here, because you haven't been working. And we haven't reached that stage, but it's so easy to imagine that we have. And this is part of our malady our imagination. We imagine so much about ourselves that isn't true. And this is what we're talking about this morning. We're talking about being able to say no to some of these things. For me to shake your confidence isn't going to do you any good. For you to shake your own confidence, take the opposite and to go and find where you can be shaken. In other words, find your weak points. Stop imagining that you don't have any weak points. But that's what we're doing. Well, you couldn't shake my confidence. What that means is I imagine I don't have any weak points. Can you expect to do this without meeting the no side of yourself? Can you really expect to be turned and twisted any way in this work, be able to write yourself without meeting the no side of yourself? You've got to be able to do this. You've got to be able to rake yourself over the coals. For some people, their way of saying yes to themselves is constantly saying no to themselves. They say, well, I say no to myself all the time. Well, they're really saying yes to themselves. Do you see that? Yes. Letting yourself go in full swing of liking and disliking, loving and hating, elation and despair, enthusiasm and dejection, and all that other stuff is far too pricey for us. It's too expensive. Having what we want because we want it is a bad idea. Giving yourself what you want, giving yourself rain, 
is a bad idea in this from a work point of view because you're giving the very thing that you want to become passive more power. And with more power, it doesn't become more passive. It becomes more active. It's important to create a middle part, neither one extreme nor the other. Otherwise, the opposites eat each other up. You can see this. You can see that opposites in a pendulum swing eat each other up. It eats up the energy. It does nothing. It's the same with us. We've got to have a middle ground inside of us because it's the middle ground is the only part from which we can grow. Our first aim is to become balanced man, number four man. It means a proper and harmonious development of all centers. These are just words for us. A proper and harmonious development of all centers are words for us. We don't really know what that means so much. Often the instinctive types or the moving types imagine that they're extremely well balanced. They don't understand the swings of the emotional types. We'll look at somebody like Tori, who obviously is an emotional type, and we look at her swings. And there are some people who are not emotional types. They're instinctive or they're moving types. And they imagine that they're more balanced. They look at the swings of the emotional type. <laughs> I'm not like that. Don't be too hasty, is my recommendation. Don't, don't be too hasty in your judgment. Lacking feeling leads to a baseless self-flattery that doesn't really do you any good. And what I've found is that often the instinctive and the moving types that are so critical of the emotional types can be critical because, just for that reason, they tend to be insensitive and indifferent. And that's really not something that can be commended in this work. Last week we talked about the war. And so somebody said they were indifferent about the war, and I said, then make up your mind, but don't be indifferent. Be a strong yes or a strong no, or be a strong yes and a strong no. So how am I on the war? I'm a strong yes and a strong no. And I can be strongly unidentified, but that's not indifferent. I can be a very strong yes. There are people on this planet that will not accept compromise, that will not accept common sense, that will not accept good reason, that will not accept a way in the wilderness, a path between the two extremes. Then what do you do? A gee, I don't know. What do you do if somebody comes in and they grab your child and they start to beat your child? What do you do? You just stand there and go, oh, I'll just pray for the person. Well, I'll tell you what I'll do. First, I'll stop the person. And while I'm stopping them, I'll be praying for them because they're going to need it. <laughs> do you understand my point? It's like there are some things you just have to have a strong yes or a strong no for, and you can still afford to be not identified. But the point is, I'm not going to not take action if I cannot be not identified, if I cannot withdraw my identification from the situation. Fine, I'll take the action that I need to take now, and I'll get my identification back later. It's a matter of being practical in life. You've got to be alive to do this work. So if a bus is bearing down on you, you can stand there and wait to get unidentified <laughs> with the bus to jump out of its way. Or you can jump out of its way and then get unidentified. Mm -hmm. My recommendation to you is you can do this work a lot better with a body. So get out of the path of the bus in any way that you can. And then go back and find out what center was doing what and what was identified and what wasn't identified and what old associations were involved and what part of you wanted to die and what part of you wanted to live. Decide all that when you're out of the path of the bus. Do you understand what I'm saying? And that's pretty much how life needs to be lived for us. In our condition, we've got to live it practically. We can't live it philosophically. We can't live it theoretically. This work is a practical experience. It's got to be applied. I found another thing, too, about the uh, instinctive moving types. As soon as you touch their appetites, their comforts, you'll find pendulum swings that are equal to the emotional types. It's just amazing to me. Mess with their comfort, mess with their appetites, and suddenly it's all a different story. Conscious restriction of the pendulum swing leading to the middle part of oneself is when we neither admit nor deny ourself. You don't have to affirm or deny yourself. You can just <laughs> let it be. One of the things you've learned in meditation, you don't have to jump on every thought and every feeling on every sensation that you have in the time that you're sitting there watching them. You don't have to admit them or deny them. Oh, this is pain. Oh, this is pleasant. You don't have to do that. You learn through experience and practice, in fact, not to do that, to just let it be, whatever it is. Well, what is that? I don't know. It's a sensation. Who cares what it is? 
it'll pass. And the wisdom in that can be carried over to this work with ourselves. You don't have to admit or deny to yourself. We're looking for something which is neither yes nor no, but yes and no. So we're looking for something different. We're looking for a third thing, not yes or no, but yes and no, a third thing. And we're looking for that in ourselves. The result of doing this is that you begin to catch a glimpse of the person objectively. So let's say you've got some person who you feel negative about. The reason I keep coming back to this is because this is something we all deal with all the time. And if we're not dealing with it, then we're denying it. We're imagining that we don't have people in our lives that we feel negatively toward, <laughs> which just isn't true. Um, George Bush, Al Gore, Ted Kennedy. Nobody had any <coughs> feelings of aversion or attraction, right? Nobody thought anything. Everybody just was flat and indifferent about that. I just don't agree. So I think if you're flat and indifferent, you're asleep. We have opinions about these people. And those opinions are based on false personality. They're not based on anything real. They're based on false personality. They're not based on our essential self because we don't know them. So they're based on false personality. So we have opinions. The result of looking at someone, neither denying ourselves or affirming ourselves and binning to ourselves or denying to ourselves anything that we see or that we think we see about them, the result of that is we begin to see the person objectively, as if the person were reflected in a mirror inside of us undistorted by subjective attitudes. See, the problem with all of the people that I mentioned is not the people. It's our subjective attitudes toward them. Well, I don't think that this is, I don't think he did the right thing. Well, I don't think that was right. I don't think this, I don't think that. I don't care what you think. And you shouldn't either. Because if you wait a couple of seconds, you'll think something differently. What I'm saying is, I don't care what you think. And the reason I don't care what you think is just because I know that you will not think that for long. Now, you need to know that. You need to observe that about yourself. And you have observed it about yourself, which is why you're smiling. Well, that's true. I will think something else. Give me a new piece of evidence or a new lie. It doesn't even have to be a new piece of evidence. Just some different information. Well, did you know that George Bush was really faking that he likes the war and all of this whole thing? Oh, no, really? Oh, yeah, he's totally against it. Yeah, he's totally against it. And he is uh, trying to prosecute the oil companies for their part in all of this. Yeah, but he can't come out and do anything about it because all this information has to be kept secret until the court case comes up. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, that changes things, doesn't it? Well, he's really a good guy. He's really not in the oil company's pockets. Wow. <laughs> I don't believe that for one second. No, of course not. Of course you don't. You're absolutely sure of yourself. You're a yes man to yourself. You're dead meat on the hoof. You're a dead man walking. Well, I don't believe that for a second. Right. Well, introduce some self-doubt in there. It's not going to hurt you. It will not hurt you to introduce some self-doubt. But it makes me uncomfortable. I didn't say it wouldn't make you uncomfortable. I said it wouldn't hurt you. There's a difference. Okay, I lied. It will hurt you. But it won't hurt the real you. It'll hurt the you you think you are. It'll sting like Bactin that says on the label, no sting. Mm -hmm. And it does sting. It's a lie. And so we lie. I lied to you. It will hurt you. But it'll hurt good. You find yourself undisturbed by the person suddenly. Free from the person and... What's even possibly more important is they're free from you. You know, look at what a burden we have been on people. Wouldn't it be nice to have people free from us? It sure would for me. It would be nice to know that you were free from me. Now, of course, you have to cooperate, which you won't because you don't want to be free from me. Mostly, we don't want to be free from anybody. We love our negative emotions. And to get rid of a whole big source of negative emotions, like, oh, no, they're too precious. They're my precious. I have to keep those. That's a whole source. That's like a bank. That's like the gift that keeps on giving. It's a wellspring in negative emotions. I couldn't cap that off. Isn't it true? I mean, isn't that the way we are? We don't want to get these people out of our lives. They are our lives. You wouldn't have a life without these people. If you've not begun to realize the opposite and contradictory sides of yourself, you're lost. We've got to work on us first. All the other people are fine, and it's fun to work on them. It really is fun, isn't it? I mean, it's fun to work on other people. We can tell exactly what's wrong with them. Boy, if we could do the surgery on them, we could really fix them up. Oh, we're like great plastic surgeons. You know, we're the nip-tuck experts. 
We're such great plastic surgeons. When it comes to someone else, we could fix them up just right, get them looking really fine. When it comes to ourselves, well, we're already looking good because we're looking in this special mirror that only shows the good, that only shows the yes. It's the yes mirror. It only says yes to us. Oh, yes, you're the most handsome man. Oh, yes, you're the most productive. Oh, yes, you're the most sensitive. Oh, yes, you're the most this. Oh, yes, you're the most humble. Absolutely. Oh, yes, you're so generous. Oh, yes. Examples? I've got millions of them. How many do you need? Well, I've got more than that. There's no end to the examples. This is the mirror we're looking in. The works just start to look in the other mirror, the no mirror. We mustn't fall into a wrong feeling of ourselves, though. Once we're negative, all we remember is unpleasant things about ourselves. See, memory is an interesting thing. We have either pleasant memories or unpleasant memories. We don't have any other kind of memories. They're either pleasant or unpleasant. Anything else doesn't matter. So we don't remember it. Isn't that true? Mm -hmm. We only remember what's pleasant or what's unpleasant. Well, when you're negative, you remember what's unpleasant. When you're feeling positive, you only remember what's pleasant. Isn't that true? So when you're in love, oh, the whole world's wonderful. All you have are pleasant memories and pleasant sensations. When you're not in love, when you're in divorce, when you're in breakup, uh, women, uh, men, uh, I'll never do it again. But, uh, it's all unpleasant. It's your state. It has nothing to do with anything else. It's just your state. We have to draw back from the negative and then say yes to ourselves in some way. So when you find yourself down on yourself, you got to draw back from the negative and begin to say yes to yourself. But when you find yourself constantly saying yes to yourself, you got to draw back from the yes and start saying no to yourself. So this is what I mean about pulling the pendulum in so that you're not swinging so far to the no, so far to the yes, but pulling it back together. You only go so far with yes. You're saying yes to yourself. Okay, just go so far with that. Then start to say no to yourself. And start to say no to yourself a little before you think you should. <laughs> <laughs> you know, and start to say yes to yourself a little before you, oh no, I haven't suffered quite enough yet. Well, start to say yes to yourself anyway, because the pendulum will still keep swinging in that direction, even though you have begun to try and pull it back the other way. So allow for that. And what we want to do is we want to establish some middle ground here where we can stand, where we can get some kind of footing and start to see ourselves in a different way. Not just this no and not just this yes, but something in the middle, something different, a third thing. And that's what we're looking for. That's what all this is about. The truth doesn't lie in yes or no, but in combination called yes and no. Truth is never in this or that. It's never in yes or no, because it can't be. Is this the truth or is that the truth? Remember we talked about this last week. Is it day or night? Well, the truth is it's day. Prove it. Well, the sun is shining. Well, the sun is out and it's bright outside. So actually the sun is probably out, but it's hiding from us behind the clouds. But this part of our earth is currently facing the sun. So we call that daylight. But the other part of our earth is not currently facing the sun. It's in the shadow of the earth itself. So we call that night. So is it day or night? Well, it's both, depending upon your perspective, depending upon your position. And this is why the truth never lies in yes or no. And we need to remain aware of this, which, is, of course, is impossible because we can't remain aware of anything. We'd have to wake up to remain aware. And we're not about to do that very easily. At least I don't seem to be able to do it very easily. Maybe the rest of you have some secret. A buzzer, you know, attack on your seat or a buzzer in your pants. I don't know. And you can just, like, wake up whenever you want. But I haven't found it to be so. I've found it to be a big struggle to wake up. I mean, a huge struggle. It's like, you know, throw water in your face, slap yourself a little bit. Like, Come on, wake up, wake up. I can't. It's just so much effort to wake up. It's, it gives me a headache to even think about waking up. When I wake up, then what? I wouldn't even know what to do if I was awake. I know what to do when I'm asleep. Just be a machine. You know, it's easy. But this being awake business, oh, I have to think, I have to do, I have this, I have that. I have to face things I don't want to face. No wonder people don't want to wake up. Can you blame them? Except we've got this nagging thing inside of us that keeps urging us for more to wake up. It couldn't be that. It's got to be. I'm pretty sure I just want a beer. <laughs> you know, you know I mean? It can't be that. I couldn't want to wake up. I'm pretty sure that urge is just the desire for a beer or something like that. You know? We may feel that we're losing our identity, but this has to happen in order for us to make any kind of real change. You're going to have to start to lose who you are, who you think you are, in order to change. How can you possibly change and still remain the same? 
You can't. <laughs> it's necessary for you to lose something in order to gain something. And the something that you're going to have to lose is who you think you are, your identity. That's scary. Well, then who will I be? I don't know. That's why I have said for years, look, get comfortable with not knowing because you're going to be spending some time there. And you will if you do this work right. If you make right effort, if you'll, if you'll practice this work properly, you will begin to spend some time in not knowing. And you can become comfortable with it. Am I a liar? Yes or no? Well, it's not black or white. It's both yes and no. This can only come through direct self-observation and self-knowledge. It releases us from the personality, shifting our center of gravity inward toward that which can grow in us. Am I a good person? Yes or no? Yes and no. Sometimes I'm a good person, sometimes I'm a bad person. That's a fact of life. Well, am I a generous person? Yes or no? Sometimes I'm very generous. Sometimes I'm as mean and stingy as Scrooge himself. So it's yes and no. We've got to learn to face these facts about ourselves. We've got to learn to stand on this middle ground, unshaken. And if you stand on this middle ground, you'll find that it's a lot easier to stand there than it is on either end of the seesaw, because it's constantly going up and down out there. But here in the middle, have you ever stood on the middle of the seesaw? It's really not so bad. You know, you kind of move your hips a little bit. It's not so bad. And they're doing, oh, the big swing out there. But in here, you're not just a little sway. It's kind of comfortable, actually. You know, it's just a little movement. It's like that. We find this middle ground. We build this middle ground of yes and no inside of ourselves. And this is where real growth can happen. Because we can look out there at that, and we can look over there at the opposite, and we can see that both are true. But they're not forever true. They're constantly changing. But in here, we can see that the change is not so big. There is something more solid in here in this middle ground. There is something more true for us. And that's as good as it gets for us right now, is something more true. We're not going to find the truth. We're going to find something more true. And we'll have to be satisfied with that for now, because that is what we are capable of. We're not capable of more. And until we are capable of more, until we can fix these machines so that they are capable of more, we have to live with what we can get. So if you can't have filet mignon, if all you can get to eat is a Zaydera hot dog, take it. Whether you can get mustard for it or not, take it. It'll keep you alive. And this is our condition. It'll keep you moving. It'll keep giving you the energy you need. Well, it's not the best energy, admittedly. The Zaydera hot dog is not the best energy you can get. But... It's what you can get. What are you going to do? Hold out for something better? Well, you can try that if you like. I'm not saying you shouldn't. I'm not saying you should. All these eyes wish you to say yes to them. Well, they got all these eyes inside of us. They all want us to say yes to them. It doesn't matter what they are. They all want us to say yes to them. They all want what we've got. When we say yes to them, we loan them our identity. If we loan them our identity enough, possession becomes nine-tenths of the law and they become us, because we don't any longer have an identity that we can put here and put there. It's something that has been attracted and caught and drags us around now. This is our current condition. We have no identity. It's whatever life does to us. So all these eyes want us to say yes to them. To what do you have to say no? Well, do you start saying no to the eyes? No to you. No to this eye. No to that eye. Well, yeah, that's one way. And we have to do that in the beginning. But we're at a place now where hopefully we can do a little more. We can say no to ourselves. We can step back to the source of those eyes and start saying no there. What is the source of those eyes? Well, your false personality, your identity, who you think you are. That's the source of all those eyes that want you to say yes to them. You can start to say no to that. You can start to say no to yourself. Well, how are you going to do that? How do you say no to yourself? Well, you agree with yourself. See, there's already a split in you. There's this work eye, this work self that wants one thing, and then there's you that doesn't want anything to do with what the work wants. Patty said this brilliantly last night. She had an argument with her son, and she won. And she went outside to cool off after this big explosion of emotion and whatever else it was. Do I have this right so yeah. far? And she said she heard this little voice inside of herself. This little tiny voice said, you know, this may not be the best thing for you. <laughs> <laughs> she said, I don't care. I'm right. I won, and I'm going to enjoy it. And this little voice said, you know, that may not be the best way to go. <laughs> Was that it? Yeah. And she didn't care. Now, you see, you agree with yourself. You agree with yourself to say no to that monster who wants its way no matter what. You agree with yourself. You see this now? You're starting to establish something inside of yourself that you can say, well, I may not be that, and I may not be that. I don't know what I am, but I do know this. I know that this is better than that, so I'm going with this. That's the agreement you make.
When you pick the better part of yourself, isn't that the agreement that you've made? This is self-remembering. Don't say no to the eyes, but to yourself. That's what self-remembering is. It's remembering yourself and remembering that self too. Remembering both these selves, that nasty self and this other self that says there's got to be a way out of this. I don't want to be the slave to this nasty thing for the rest of my life. You start to remember that and you choose. You choose according to your work aim, what it is you want, what may be best for you. This may not be so good for you. <laughs> I like that. She was explaining it and she explained it in this little voice that I could really hear it. You could hear the reality of the whole situation as she explained it. It's like, boy, I know that one. It's a very small part of us, and it's a very quiet part of us that says, this may not be the best course you've ever chosen. <laughs> I don't think this is a good idea. Shut up! What do you know? I'm getting my way. It may not be that good for you. Gurdjieff said, in self-remembering, which self do you wish to remember? I love the way Gurdjieff put things. Well, in self-remembering, which self do you want to remember? Well, there's a problem. <laughs> uh, I don't know. Which one do you think I should remember? And that's where the work comes in. The work tells us which one to remember. Well, until you know for yourself which one to remember, use this as a guidepost. It's a great place to start. It's a great practical thing. I and myself decide to say no to ourselves, as if we couldn't be disturbed by any of the surrounding eyes. It's like meditation. I have decided I'm going to sit here for an hour and 10 minutes, and I'm not going to move. And I've decided with something inside of me, haven't I? I've made this agreement with something inside of me, myself, haven't I? Mm -hmm. So who made the agreement? Well, I don't know. I and myself. We made this agreement that all these other thoughts and feelings and sensations are not going to make us move. They're not going to make us get up. They're not going to make us, oh, I forgot. i got to do this. Oh, i, I got to do that. Oh, I'm tired of this. I've had enough of this. I've done enough. Well, this is enough. No, 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 no. I and myself have decided none of those eyes get to say. You've already found something stronger in yourself. You've already found some middle ground. You're already starting to build something when you can do that. Self-remembering means remembering and so contracting and contacting some self, contracting with some self, so contacting and then contracting with some self in us that lifts us above the power of the crowd of eyes all around us. We make a contract with ourselves. When you sit down and meditate, you've made a contract with yourself, haven't you? Mm -hmm. yes. This is what I'm going to do. You have a strong resolve. Strong determination. This is what I'm going to do. Even though you may not be capable of doing it. We must learn not to identify with ourselves and not always go with self-will. goes back to that simple thing we say in the work. Do what the false personality doesn't like. What that means is don't always go with your self-will. This whole thing this morning was all about explaining how to not do what the false personality likes. Do something else. Learn not to identify with ourselves and not to always go with our self-will. If we could do that, and we can, if we can do that more and more, we will start to gain the power and the strength that we need to begin to wake up, shake ourselves free from this insane world of sleep in which we are trapped. We're tied to the wheel. We're chained to this wheel where we just constantly keep going day in and day out the same thing over and over and over. The same stupid stuff that we don't want to do. And if you want to be free, this is what you have to do to get free.